thousand. That's the number of people who receive a law degree every single year. Twelve lakh. That was the number of registered advocates in the country back in 2013, according to the Bar Council of India. 140 crores. That's the current population of India. How can we expect a population of 12 lakh lawyers that's been growing at a pace of less than a lakh a year to help over 140 crore Indians to navigate the law? The answer is simple: we can't. But the truth is that neither I nor any other individual can tell you what it's going to take to transform the Indian legal system. What I can do, and what I'm hoping to do, is tell you how the pursuit of finding a problem that I want to solve transformed my life. Back in the eighth grade, I had a life plan set in concrete. I wanted to attend the best-ranked law school in India, and I wanted to practice law in the Supreme Court. In fact, I wanted to be India's youngest senior advocate. At the age of 18, part of my dreams came true. I started my BA LLB program at my dream university, except things were not going according to plan. I went from the high of performing really well in my 12th grade exams to suddenly failing my papers in law school. I was shocked. My first year of law school was so incredibly difficult for me because if I couldn't understand the law, how on earth was I going to become a senior advocate? When I started my second year, the question that I was asking myself changed a little bit. I stopped asking myself, "Why can't I understand the law?" And I started asking myself, "Why is the law so difficult to understand?" I think that that one question may have changed my life entirely. I couldn't help but think how much more difficult it is for someone without formal legal education to navigate the law. And this becomes so much more true when you realize that most people's mindset about the law is dispute resolution oriented, meaning that people think you only have to navigate the law when you have a dispute. You need to find a lawyer. You need to go to court. This couldn't be farther than the truth. Every single day, every single aspect of our lives is controlled by the law. The food we eat, the clothes we wear, who we choose to love. My conversation with you right now is controlled by what the law says is permissible. So, in a world where the law decides what goes, it was unacceptable to me that the law was so difficult to navigate. So, at the age of 19, I started an initiative called Outlawed India to help school children learn about the law. Here's what I thought: I thought if we could get young people to start understanding the law. Then they wouldn't be thrown into the deep end of the pool when they have to navigate the law as adults. As a personality, I tend to act on things as soon as I think about it, and Outlawed India was no different. I put out a rather ugly social media post asking for people interested in the cause of legal awareness to join me. Before I knew it, 18 of us from law, engineering, medical, design backgrounds. Had come together to form one cohesive unit, Outlawed India. We spent the first 60 months, first six months, curating upwards of 60 modules of legal topics that are relevant to the day-to-day -day lives of people. We then trained and onboarded 50 university students, much like yourselves who are studying law and policy, and we got them to facilitate legal awareness workshops. In the first year of Outlawed India. We facilitated legal awareness workshops for 3,000 people across five cities and in four regional languages. We were thrilled that we were able to do this. The first time that I conducted a, a legal awareness workshop myself, it was during the second wave of COVID. I was conducting a workshop on key criminal law processes, and the workshop was happening in Canada. Because that was the language that the students were comfortable with. Now, my mother tongue is Canada. I grew up speaking Canada, and I thought the workshop was going great. I thought I was doing a fantastic job, as most of us do, I suppose. 
except during lunch break, one of the students walked up to me and said, Kannada recent ak kaltidira? Meaning, have you recently learned Kannada? I was so taken aback. I said, why are you asking me this? He said, even though you're teaching in Kannada, you're still saying words like warrant, bail, Indian penal code in English. And he went on to explain how that prevented him from really understanding what I was saying. That was a wake-up call I needed. Understanding that legalese or legal language coupled with our overwhelming usage of English in the law has closed off a large section of Indians, if not a majority of Indians, from actually engaging with the law. In 2021, I was deeply unsatisfied with the work we were doing at Outlawed India. I had a nagging feeling at the back of my head that said awareness is not enough. Awareness of the law isn't enough to get people to engage with the law. So I took this feeling back to my team, and together we decided that we were going to pivot from the idea of legal awareness and move instead to the idea of everyday citizen skills. So that's exactly what we did. We started teaching people how to file right to information applications. We taught people how to file public interest litigations. We helped create templates for people that they could use to file a complaint with the police. We signed an agreement with the Delhi government where we trained over 600 Anganwadi workers on how to access social welfare schemes. These skills really stuck. We realized that citizen skills are incredibly valuable. In 2022, my work with Outlawed India dipped. I had internships, I had college work, I had exams, and frankly, my work with Outlawed India was in a slump. I was not a good leader. I stopped communicating effectively with my team and eventually stopped talking to them altogether. After a few months, I thought of reaching out, but the truth is that I was too embarrassed. I was too embarrassed that I had been a bad leader and that now they wouldn't forgive me for it. As luck would have it, around the same time, an organization that we were working with came out with a comic about Outlawed India. I remember sitting on the couch and flipping through this comic and realizing the incredible work that we'd done and understanding what an incredible team that I had. I immediately reached out to my team and I apologized. And I very honestly told them that I was just overwhelmed with work and I stopped doing a good job of Outlawed India. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because people make leadership seem like it's a linear journey. People make it seem as though you wake up a good lawyer or you wake up a good leader and you go to sleep as a good leader. And the truth couldn't be farther than this. There's a lot of ups and downs in your journey that people just don't tell you about. Now that I figured out that, okay, it's all right that I messed up, I realized in October 2022, in the middle of an internship with a company that I thought I wanted to work at after graduation, that I actually wanted to run Outlawed India full time. And I wasn't kidding earlier when I said that I act on my thoughts very quickly, because by December 2022, Outlawed India was a registered not-for-profit company. I opted out of sitting for very lucrative placements in college, and I turned down an independent job offer that I'd gotten. People frequently ask me, was that a scary decision to make? Were you really aware of all the consequences that could have come out of you doing this? The truth is that when you're a 23-year-old woman who wants to run her own company, that too not-for-profit company, straight out of college, there aren't a lot of people who take you seriously. I've had people and organizations turn down funding because we're young. I've had male colleagues misbehave with me because I'm a woman founder. And I was aware of these challenges, and these are challenges I continue to overcome till date. But the truth is that when you start your own initiative, for profit or not for profit, we have a tendency to glorify the hurdles that we face. And the truth is that I didn't face any earth-shattering hurdle that would have prevented me from working on this problem. I had the privilege of family and friends who could support me emotionally and financially, 
And with great privilege comes great responsibility. So as a young student running Outlawed India and starting Outlawed India, this was me taking responsibility. So on 26 December 2022, I became the director of a registered not-for-profit company called Outlawed India. At this point, I had about six months left in university, and I had a long list of things I needed to figure out. I needed to raise funds for my organization. I had to set up a full-time team that would work with me. And on average, I was signing upwards of 100 documents a day. <laughs> and these are challenges that people don't necessarily tell you about. But all of these issues was still background noise to me because I had one very important question that I wanted to answer. What is the problem that Outlawed India seeks to solve? What I want to do is take you through my thought process in how we arrived at this answer to show you that transformation involves so much trial and error. Let's go back to the statistic that I started with. We're relying on 12 lakh lawyers to help over 140 crore Indians to navigate the law. The sheer difference in numbers will tell you that in the lifetime of an average Indian who probably makes less than 15,000 rupees a month, accessing a lawyer is probably out of the question. In part, this reliance or dependence on lawyers that we've created has come from this lack of awareness and lack of legal skills. And if you will remember, this was part of the problem that we were working on back in 2019. But we realized back then that awareness was not enough to get people engaged with the law. So the first problem that we identified is that legal awareness by itself is not a sufficient metric that we need to use. So now we know that it's not enough. What's the missing part of the equation? We realized that for decades and centuries now, we've been adopting a top-down approach to resolving community legal issues. What we needed to do is take the law back to communities, back to low-income groups, back to marginalized communities, and give them back control of the law. We needed these people to be active stakeholders in the law. That was our second problem that change could only occur when communities themselves have control of the law. So this is great. We know that awareness is not enough. We know that communities need control of the law. But how do we get there? What's been preventing us from getting there? We realize that two big obstacles lie in the way. First is language, something I spoke to you about, that legalese and English has prevented a large section of Indians from accessing the law. But we also realized that we've created a system where you need a law degree to engage with the law. And we think this is a problem. Acquiring a law degree requires money. It requires high-level English proficiency, and honestly, quite a lot of privilege. So how could we bypass this requirement for a formal legal education? That was our third problem which was overcoming structural issues. Now that we'd identified our three problems, the answer was very clear. Outlawed India is trying to help communities independently access law and justice. And in order to do that, we realized that our answer lies with paralegals. In India, back in 2009, the National Legal Services Authority notified a scheme for paralegals, where people like government school teachers, law students, people part of self-help groups, prisoners, all of them could become paralegals. And this was revolutionary to us. And it was revolutionary because these people didn't require formal legal education to become paralegals. So we wanted to train paralegals, but we didn't stop there. We realized that training paralegals ran the same risk of conducting just another legal awareness workshop. So what we're doing now is creating a digital marketplace for paralegals, where we're listing paralegals on a platform. People will be able to sign up onto our platform, receive help in getting an FIR registered, receiving help with doing an alternative dispute resolution like mediation, getting first point of contact legal aid. All of this is possible, and it's possible for free. The solution that we got to of paralegals and our digital marketplace 
was built on the back of solutions that didn't work by themselves. What we did now was we coupled legal aid with the training and with supply of knowledge because we realized that legal awareness wasn't enough. We've accounted for language-based accessibility because paralegals will largely be communicating in regional languages. We've bypassed the requirement for formal legal education by engaging paralegals instead of just saying we're going to get more lawyers to do pro bono work. People and ideas transform over time. Each and every single idea that we have has the potential to change a real world problem. I want to let you know that Outlawed India changed my life. It took a girl who thought her place was in litigation and it brought me here. The truth is that there are too many problems in this world for all of us to be solving the same ones. So don't pick a profession. Pick a problem and work backwards from there. Don't just choose to be a lawyer, an engineer, or a doctor. Choose to solve critical issues of livelihood, discrimination, and health. Choose to take responsibility. Thank you so much.